morning, everyone. Thank you very much for being here this morning. Uh, I'd like to begin with a brief opening statement, and then we can go to any questions that you might have. William Shakespeare was a master of words, and in his play Twelfth Night, we hear Sebastian say to Antonio, I can no other answer but thanks, and thanks and ever thanks. Those are my sentiments this morning as I return to ministry in the diocese. Thank you. To all those who prayed for me during my illness, thank you very much. To all those who sent an overwhelming number of cards and letters and emails and books and prayer chains and homemade gifts and food, thank you very much for your generosity. For all those who reminded me to trust in God's will, thank you. I am especially grateful to four priests, Monsignor Robert Sifrin, the Vicar General of the Diocese, Monsignor John Zora, Chancellor of the Diocese, Monsignor Peter Polando, the Judicial Vicar, and Father John Jarek, who's the Vicar for Clergy. Each one of them visited me each one of the four weeks that I was at the Cleveland Clinic and informed me of diocesan matters and kept the diocese running smoothly. I am likewise extremely grateful to my primary care physician here in Youngstown, Dr. James Kravitz, the team of doctors at the Cleveland Clinic, headed by Dr. Ronald Sobex and his lead nurse, Megan Nelson, and a wonderful nurse from just north of here on 11 in Rock Creek by the name of Jane, who came to visit me and encouraged me every day that she was on duty. Because of all of those people, I am now 100% cancer free. And my energy level is almost back to normal. Although a friend of mine did say, I think that's much better than before you got sick. <laughs> I look forward to returning to work and reconnecting with the people of the diocese part time for a short time and then later full time. Let me now turn to another pertinent topic, the sexual abuse crisis uh, in the church. I believe that all of you have seen a copy of the letter which was read at all the masses. And there are three points that I would like to add to that letter. First of all, I believe that the files relating to Archbishop McCarrick should be open to a group of competent lay people to determine how his predatory behavior went unreported. At the same time, mechanisms must be developed to report allegations against other bishops so that they can be adequately investigated and resolved. Secondly, last Wednesday, I spoke with County Prosecutor Paul Gaines and assured him that if he decided to review our files on priests, who have been credibly accused of sexual abuse, he would be welcome. Now, of course, our diocese includes more than one county, and I will have to speak to the other county prosecutors, but I began that conversation with Mr. Gaines. Thirdly, when a priest has been removed from ministry during my tenure for a credible allegation of sexual abuse, all of the parishes or schools where he was stationed were notified in writing and were invited to contact us if they knew of someone who had been abused or had been abused themselves. During the next two months, we will bring together all of those names in one place and publish them on the diocesan website. I urge anyone who has been abused to come forward and speak with our Victim Assistance Coordinator, retired Sergeant Delphine Baldwin Casey, who can be reached at 330-718-1388. And that call, of course, is confidential. Again, I thank you very much for your presence here this morning, and I now will be happy to take any questions that you might have. So, 
Are you saying that books do exist like they did in PA with complaints? And you have a number of complaints? Books do exist with you, complaints. I don't know what you mean. Was that what you were saying? Did no, no. What I'm saying is we have files. Files, right. We have, we have files. Mm -hmm. Uh, Any time uh, we have we have a file on every priest. There's a mm -hmm. file on me, okay. and uh, uh, if a priest behaves inappropriately and if there's been a credible allegation, there's a record of that, and that's what happened in Pennsylvania. They went back through those records. So I wanted to, to be clear uh, to Paul Gaines and the other prosecutors that if they chose it legally, it has to be their choice. If they chose to uh, ask to see the files, they would be welcome to see them. Gotcha. And, okay. Um, so, but do you know? Oh, I'm sorry. 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 i am sorry i all of that information, so it's in one place. But has the church here counted them already? And are you aware of how many have in the past had complaints? I don't know of the, uh, the uh, past complaints. We, I want to go back as far as we can to get as much information as we can. How many years have those files been kept? I would have to look. I don't know. What has Paul Gaines said as far as whether he is interested in this or not? Uh, I would leave that to uh, Mr. Gaines. I can't speak for him. Okay. When did you have this discussion with him? Wednesday. Wednesday. Okay. And he did not say then whether he was interested or not? He spoke to me confidentially. Okay. We will be talking with him. I'm Good. Sure. <laughs> okay. And, um, you know, in, in the past there have been, you know, people outside protesting saying, we want access to those files. Please open them up. And what was the church's response to them on whether those files existed or not? We always said that there were files on priests. And when there was a complaint, that's part of the, uh, the file. But we can't open uh, personnel files to just anyone. We can open them to a prosecutor. We can open them to an attorney. But somebody on the street, I mean, would you want your personnel file to go to somebody who is uh, representing a, a rival news company? I would not mind. Anyone could look at my personnel file. Oh, good. Okay, <laughs> fine. You bring it in, I'll look. You can look. <laughs> I'll give you mine. You give me That's perfectly yours. fine. I'm sure ours are fine. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, there, there are privacy laws. There are privacy laws that have to be respected. There are confidentiality issues that have to be respected. So in, uh, in our process, uh, a few years ago, I had a, um, a retired judge come in and go through the files to make sure that we have done things in an appropriate way and not, not missed anything. And uh, he gave us a thumbs up and said that the files were in order. Beyond that, it's up to Mr. Gaines and the other prosecutors if they want to examine the files. My point is that if they do want to examine the files, we are not going to object to that. And how soon could that process begin? Of, uh, of examining those files? Whenever they want. Now, we need some time to bring everything together. Because as I mentioned to you, uh, the problem that I see is that when an incident has occurred, We've informed the parish where the person has been and the schools, and then we also follow up with um, the person's assignments. Let's say they've been in five parishes. So we contact all five parishes. And a letter went out saying, this has happened. We have this information. If you have been abused or if you have any information about someone who's been abused, let us know. Uh, what we haven't done is put all of, put all of those in, uh, in one place. And that's what, what we're going to do. Okay, so also if, um, let's say, person A has went to a certain, you know, had, alleges that they were abused at a certain time and placed by a certain member of the church, mm -hmm. um, 
if they get an attorney, can that attorney look at that file? What would be the process for them, for a person who was allegedly abused? Uh, the, what we do is encourage the person to go to law enforcement and also to come to us. Some people don't want to go to law enforcement and come to us. Some people don't want to go to us and go to law enforcement. An attorney uh, would have access to uh, those uh, files. And we have uh, retired Sergeant Delphine Baldwin Casey, is our, who's right over there, is our victim assistance coordinator. And she would help the person so that the person can find peace. But there would be an investigation. We have had cases where people have alleged abuse, and when it was investigated, it's been shown that it simply didn't happen. So, so. Qu quick question, so how will that uh, victim, if you know they come to you or come to the police, how will, how will you ensure them that uh, their case will be taken seriously and that if they are accused of it, it wouldn't be uh, hidden like it was in Pennsylvania? Well, because of the fact that uh, that has been our process, we have a track record of being very open about that. And uh, we keep the, um, the name of the victim confidential, and we assume that law enforcement is going to keep that information confidential. But that's why I want to have these ongoing checks to make sure nothing slips between the cracks. Gotcha. I know the uh, proposed actions that you had in the, the letter. Um, how do you think that will turn out in November? I'm sorry, which action? The, uh, all, all three of the actions that you proposed. In the oh, letter. well. How do you think that's going to play out? In um, I was speaking with uh, the general secretary of the conference, the bishop's conference on Saturday, and he said lots of bishops are sending in suggestions about how to go forward with this. So uh, what they're going to do is eliminate from the agenda anything that is um, that can be uh, punted to the summer and spend time talking about this and looking at different options and come up with something that will be realistic and concrete. As I said in my letter, words are simply not enough. And so we've got to have some concrete actions. So I will advocate for the things I said in my letter and these three points. Uh, at the November meeting. Gotcha. And also, um, what do you have to say to people who have left, uh, left because or left the church because of uh, all this going on? I'm very sorry they've left, and I wish they would return because I believe that uh, hearing the word of God and the scriptures and receiving the Holy Eucharist is uh, essential for our journey of faith. But I understand where they're coming from. I understand the frustration and the anger and. Uh, some of those people have written to me, some of them have called, and I've tried to respond to them uh, as best I can. Gotcha. And also, um, how, do you, how will you ensure people around here that this won't happen in our community? I think that I can assure them that we have safe environment programs in each one of our schools and parishes. I think that I can assure them that we have a, an office here in the diocese that is doing oversight of this and that we will take every possible step to uh, ensure this does not happen here. Father Frent, um, he had denied this until I think, I'm not sure if it was Delphine Baldwin Casey, I think she had dug up some more evidence that this had actually gone on for a few year period and this was with an adult. Uh, I guess it was a consensual relationship, I'm not sure. Um, and um, he had denied it until, I guess, he was confronted with this evidence. Um, what are your comments on Father Frent, and um, when will, how, how does that parish go forward? When will you be looking at appointing someone else to replace him to lead that parish forward? Well, we're already looking at um, another priest to uh, become the pastor there. We have a personnel board uh, of priests, and they will make a recommendation to me about who would be good to, uh, to go there. Uh, going back to the first part of uh, your question, uh, please remember what I said earlier about investigation. There are allegations that come in uh, that range from sexual abuse to misappropriation of funds uh, to the pastor moved the book that I put down on a table in the back church. 
And uh, any time an allegation comes in, we have to investigate because it is important that we maintain fairness. So in the situation with uh, Father Frank, uh, we received this allegation and investigated it and could not find evidence to support the allegation. Later on, we did find evidence to support that and then Father admitted that that was the case and that's when we moved on. So was it the church that found evidence or was it an investigator that found evidence or was it the lady that came forward and found evidence and then he admitted or what was the process? We use a uh, private investigation firm of former FBI agents uh, for most of these cases and uh, in, in each one of the situations you know, the good thing about them, because they've been in the FBI, is they know how to ask the right questions and get the answers. So uh, it was a combination of our own investigation and some other information that was brought to us by another person that led us to um, come to the conclusion that this needed more investigation. And when Father Fred was presented with this, he admitted to it. And then there's also been a lot of controversy around Pope Francis now, um, and um, I'd like your take on what's going on at the top of the Catholic Church with uh, allegations that he knew about what was going on and is actually was part of the cover-up. The answer to that is um, I don't know, frankly. Uh, I read that letter by Archbishop uh, Vigano. I called a number of bishops that I know personally who also know Archbishop Vigano uh, to try to get a read on uh, his integrity, uh, his, um, uh, his background. I mean, I've met Archbishop Vigano a number of times, but I don't know him. Um, the allegations he makes are very serious allegations. The problem I have with what he says in the letter, uh, well, I guess the two problems I have with what he says in the letter are, this, are these. First of all, some of it comes across as settling scores, and um, he, he's very critical of a number of, of uh, people in, in the uh, Vatican bureaucracy, and um, some people who have not been as um, supportive of him and his ministry. So some of it comes across that way when you read it. The other problem I have is that nothing he says is substantiated. And um, that leaves me in a quandary. Uh, if you're gonna make these allegations, I think you've gotta have something behind it. You've gotta be able to say, you, you can't just say I was at a meeting and the two of us talked and I said this. No one else heard that and so He's making such serious allegations and calling upon the Pope to resign without any background or substantiation. Now, I, I think that uh, the response of, um, of the Holy Father on the plane coming back from Ireland was inadequate. Uh, I think he has to say more about this, and I know that the President of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, Cardinal Daniel DiNardo, and Cardinal Sean O'Malley from Boston uh, have asked for an audience with the Pope uh, to talk about the McCarrick issue and this issue. And I don't know what the date of that. It hasn't happened yet, but I, I, uh, I do know that they have asked for an audience. And then what would you say about the rest of the honest, uh, wonderful priests who are working to serve God and lead souls to Christ, what would you say about the majority of, of them who aren't doing God's work? That I admire Since them. Since that sort of gets lost in It the, does, it really does. I, I, uh, I admire and uh, I love the priests of this diocese and, and I like priests. Uh, I, I'm very comfortable with, with priests. And it, their work gets pushed off to the side. And when I talk to parishioners, they tell me about how much they love their priests in in the, uh, in the parish. Um, they, will, they will often say that um, they even have some appreciation for the bishop, but they don't have appreciation for 
bishops in, you know, in general. Uh, and I, I, I think that we're responsible for that because it just was not handled well. Uh, I, I think this whole thing about uh, covering this up or uh, not being upfront about it, uh, you know, um, one priest said to me, and I completely agree, he said, there are two problems here. There are priests who have unfortunately behaved poorly and they're a very small minority. He said the other problem is bishops who have covered this up and allowed this to continue. So I think we have to tackle both, and I think we've got to tackle it through uh, the conference with the, uh, with the joint action of uh, the Vatican. But I am greatly uh, appreciative and thankful for the work that our priests do Every day. Uh, yes, Sri. question. Uh, what precipitated your um, diagnosis? Did you go to a checkup or in this? Um, for the month of um, April, I was extremely tired and um, just dragging. And a number of people mentioned that to me. You just don't seem to have uh, very much uh, energy. And I had a couple days towards the end of the month of April that I had trouble standing up. I'd be getting out of bed in the morning and I was holding onto the wall uh, to move. And, and so I finally uh, called my doctor and explained to him what was going on. And he said, I think you need to go to the emergency room. And I suppose like most guys, I said, oh, it's not that bad. And um, I said, you know, it'll go away in a couple days. He said, no, you need to go to the emergency room. I'll meet you there in 10 minutes. So I went to the emergency room, and um, they did a series of tests. Uh, and one of the tests they did was a bone marrow biopsy, uh, where they discovered that my hemoglobin levels were extremely low. And they sent the, uh, the biopsy off to a place in Connecticut, and that was on a Thursday. And on Sunday morning, they got the results back that it was leukemia. And um, Dr. Kravick and the other doctors said to me, you need to go to the Cleveland Clinic immediately. We've already called the ambulance. Um, how do you think it's impacted your faith? Oh, um, the first week I was in the Cleveland Clinic, uh, I was described as in critical condition. I didn't know what was going to happen. And uh, the Cleveland Clinic was wonderful. The doctors were great. The nurses were great. Um, I could not have asked for uh, better care. But I did not know what was going to go on, so, uh, or what was going to eventually happen. So um, I ha had to find things to do. So I decided that the best thing to do would be to start planning my funeral. Um, and I did that. And it, it's all ready now. So then. <laughs> Should it happen? <laughs> Who's doing what? What the song? So it's all done. <laughs> um, but it gave me something to do. It was it was concrete, you know. Uh, and my brother was there a lot, which was great. Um, and as I mentioned, Monsignor Siffer and Monsignor Zora, Father Jarek and Father Monsignor Polando would come up, and they'd divide up the days. So I had some company. But the, the first week I was there, I had chemotherapy seven days a week uh, for 24 hours a day on a drip. And um, I fortunately did not have many of the side effects such as vomiting or nausea or uh, headaches or s trouble sleeping. I was just fatigued. And then the second week I was off chemo <clears throat> completely. And the third week, beginning of the third week, they did another bone marrow biopsy. And they told me that it had to come back at 5% or less, otherwise I had to go through the chemo regimen again. And there were all these people praying for me, and I felt the prayers, and it came back at zero. So, it was worth it. Bishop Murray, what have you learned about yourself personally during this whole uh, health situation <laughs> that you feel that would help someone else that you would share with them, who might be going through the same situations? Um, the first thing is um, a, a deeper trust in, in the Lord's will uh, that 
when I when I started down this road uh, at the beginning of May, there was nothing I could do. I mean, there there was nothing. I couldn't rearrange things. I I couldn't say if I get up and walk around the hospital 15 times, this is going to go away. I simply had to rely upon uh, God's love for me and for all people and the prayers that were out there. So um, that may be an experience of more uh, patience, but it certainly was an experience of, of deepening faith. I spent much more time praying and uh, spent much more time listening to people who were saying, you just have to trust in God in this. Um, the other thing I learned was uh, an administrative uh, lesson. Um, I learned that I didn't have to be in the office as much as I thought I did, uh, that I could be out more, because the office is run very well by uh, the, uh, the four who were doing it, and uh, it gives me more time uh, to visit around the diocese and attend different uh, diocesan uh, functions. Um, and I think the third thing that, uh, that I learned, it, there was the spiritual, there was the administrative, and then I think on the personal level, um, I was just surprised by how many people wrote or called or sent emails. It was amazing. And when I got back, my secretary said, it's gonna take you weeks to go through all these boxes. Um, but it, 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 it really was um, overwhelming. Uh, I got one card from a young lady, a 10-year-old, and she sent me a picture of herself and her cat. That was on one side of the card. On the other side of the card was a $5 bill. And at the bottom she wrote, this is to help you with your medical expenses. <laughs> it was so kind, it really was. And then I got uh, one of the most moving letters I have ever gotten in my life was from an 18 year old. Uh, and I, I cherish both of those because they were so kind. So um, uh, it, it was learning that um, I have tried to do everything possible to sell, tell the people at the diocese that I love them and care about them. And it just floored me that so many of them returned that love. Yes, sir. And just tell me about the uh the experience that you had when you found out that you were 100% cancer free? Well, aside from jumping up and down and dancing, <laughs> um, the four doc I had a team of four doctors, and the four doctors came in and stood at the bottom of my bed, and they were smiling. And I thought, oh, that's a good sign. So one of them said, have you heard the good news yet? And I said, no. And the head doctor said uh, that your test came back as being uh, 100% cancer free. And uh, so now we go on with the rest of it. Well, I was just extremely happy, of course, and uh, said a, a famous uh, old prayer in the church, the Te Deum, to thank God for the gift of uh, restoring my health. So it, it was uh, uh, the, the two days that were most, or the two experiences that were most disconcerting, I guess, was when they when three doctors stood at the foot of my bed at St. Elizabeth's and said, you have leukemia, and then when the four doctors came in and said, it's gone. <laughs> so, that was good. When were you released? I was, was released on June the 1st. And how soon do you uh, expect, when do you expect to go back full time? Oh, I'll probably do about two weeks of uh, part-time and then just ease into full-time. Yeah. Welcome back and thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here today. God bless you.